application. Please use that to submit questions. We'll take any questions throughout the presentation and then we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Any questions that we're not able to get to due to time constraints will be answered via email. If you have any questions about that process, feel free to submit them via chat as well. And now I'd like to say good morning to Brenda and turn it over to her. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, Travers Connect is thrilled to be teaming up with the team at SafetyNet. And um, please, again, don't forget to ask questions throughout the, the session. And I'm going to uh, just give you a little insight about our two speakers. Eric and Tim, and I'm going to start with Eric. Um, Eric Anderson has been with SafetyNet since 2013. He's a senior network engineer. He specializes in clients with international operations and is the point of contact for the DOD DHS accreditation projects for clients servicing uh, government sectors. He is responsible for implementation of large-scale technology deployments. And as Eric says, in his past life, uh, he was Information Assurance Security Officer and Security System Administrator for ITT Excellus Mission Systems in Afghanistan. And uh, prior to that, he was also Supervisor of Network Operations and Lead Systems Administrator for Raytheon Polar Services Company in Antarctica. Eric has over 20 years experience of IT and uh, in multiple industries certifications, including GCIH through the Global Information Assurance Certification, MCSE and CCNA. And then we also have Tim Cerny. Uh, Tim is the CEO of SafetyNet and has spent most of his career leading IT managed services, IT recruitment, and vendor management solutions co companies. Prior to joining SafetyNet in 2019, Tim led AHSA, a Traverse City-based provider of healthcare workforce and technology solutions servicing over 300 hospitals across the country. He began his career with Tech Systems, the largest IT staffing and service company in North America, where he finished his last year overseeing their Canadian operations while living in Toronto. Tim's a boomeranger. He's a native of Traverse City and returned um, to his home uh, to enjoy a fulfilling career while he and his wife raised their children in what they consider God's country. For the last six years, he has served as president of the board for the Traverse City Junior Golf Association and he enjoys boating, playing golf, chasing his oldest son's college football career around the Big Ten. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to start today's session. Um, we're gonna let you take it away, Tim. Great, thanks, thanks Brenda, appreciate uh, the introductions. Uh, and hello everybody. Um, although it's, uh, I can't necessarily see you, I, uh, I assume you can see me and hear me well. Um, what a different world we're living in today. Um, <clears throat> it's quite amazing, changes on a daily basis, but it was only 35 days ago on Thursday, March 12th, uh, that I called a meeting with my leadership team at work to discuss the pandemic and uh, an upcoming trip that we had with a group of us from Traverse City down to, to go down to our set, uh, Detroit office uh, for a vision and strategy meeting. And so it was on that Thursday that we had that meeting. By Monday, 33 of the 35 safety net employees were uh, working from home. And my position on how serious we needed to take that pandemic coming in that meeting went from, ah, we'll be fine. Now let's just go, let's go to the meeting, take the trip, to holy cow, we need to take action on this right now and all of that, that, that mindset change happened probably in 30 seconds. I, I can remember it happening. And I'm sure for many of you guys on the phone, the same thing occurred. It may have hit you on a different day, but I'll tell you what, I can, I'll never forget how fast that changed. It just amazes me how this pandemic has demonstrated our ability as humans to evolve and change. I mean, at that moment when my opinion shifted 
about the seriousness of COVID-19 and its uh, potential impacts on my colleagues, our clients, and of course our business. Uh, I'll tell you one thing I did leave with was confidence. Uh, confidence that one, that I, I'm not too headstrong to change my opinion quickly. And in, in particular, do that in front of my leadership team, which we were having a discussion about at the moment, but confidence in our flexibility and willingness to adapt on a dime. And as stubborn as we all can be sometimes, including me, uh, uh, you know, look at us right now. I mean, we're all collaborating like never before and, uh, you know, and accelerating the use of tools like, uh, this 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 application that we're using now, and um, we press on with what is now the new normal, you know, and and I think we should be proud of that. But unfortunately, um, the reason we're here today is, is because, in addition to us having the ability to change, so do the bad guys out there, uh, the cybersecurity criminals. They change, they adapt, they press on with tactics once aimed directly at your in-house IT infrastructure. Now they're discovering ways to do that through your home office, which we are most likely all calling in from. As you can see, I'm sitting in my home. And for the last 17 years, my team here at SafetyNet has been helping companies in our, in our community secure their data and protect their company from cybersecurity threats. And so one thing is for certain with IT, it's, it too is always changing. And so are the ways that cyber criminals and ransomware viruses are attacking your data. You know, our goal today is to share our expertise and provide you insights, some steps, uh, some precautions for you and your business that you should be taking to fortify your data and, uh, and, and do so in this new world from, uh, and working from home. So on that note, I'll just turn it over to Eric. Uh, our expert in this area, and uh, you can kind of give everybody some details on, on uh, and ideas on what they can do to, to secure their information. Great. Uh, thank you, Tim, for uh, the introduction there and uh, sort of some uh, preface to this. Um, as Tim said, uh, everything is changing right now with uh, the new remote environment that we're working from, and um, we're adapting uh, in information security just, uh, just as everyone else is. So, uh, I wanted to start off by um, giving an overview of what it means when we talk about information security. And uh, really the three tenants that we um, focus on, we call it the information security triad. Uh, everything that we do, we try to bake these principles into and uh, ensure that uh, by following these, uh, we're keeping everyone secure. So uh, the three main focus areas are integrity, confidentiality, and availability. Um, integrity, uh, what we want to ensure is that the data that you're using, the data that you created, you generated, is actually the data um, that you, you built, uh, that it hasn't been modified, it hasn't been touched or, or changed uh, by anybody unauthorized to do so. Um, I, I like to use the analogy uh, when we're talking about the, the triad here uh, of a bank account. Um, you want to make sure that when you write a check for $100, uh, that it goes to your bank, it's $100 when they cash it, and then your bank balance, your statement reads at $100. Um, that allows you to ensure that the check that you wrote was accurate, it hasn't been modified, nobody changed it to, uh, from 100 to 1,000. So um, that handles the integrity portion. Um, then we wanna secure that uh, environment. So we wanna make sure that the confidentiality is intact. Uh, we don't want to have uh, an unknown person access your bank account. Um, we wanna make sure that authorized users are the only ones that can see it. Um, and then going along with the uh, confidentiality, confidentiality and the integrity, we wanna make sure that the data is available when you wanna use it. So um, we're looking at uh, when you wanna have access to your bank account that you can access it and go down there and withdraw money. Uh, from an information security perspective, especially now that we've transitioned to home offices, we wanna make sure that uh, the end users can access your data and you're doing it still maintaining that confidentiality and integrity. So talking about how we do this and some of the technologies that we use, um, one of the analogies that we often bring up is a layered security approach. We approach information security as an onion with your data being right in the center and the core of what we want to protect. And then we layer on different security technologies and principles 
in order to ensure that nobody can access the core of that and, and your data. So uh, some of these are familiar uh, to most people. Um, antivirus software has been around since uh, uh, pretty much the beginning of uh, networking and the internet. Um, uh, we use spam prevention. Uh, most of the emails that come through our systems now are spam. They're not actual valid emails. Uh, they're phishing emails or they're advertisements. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen our mailboxes flooded with these. So uh, we do some uh, detection there and we do some virus detection also on the spam filtering side to sort of reduce that threat from email. Web content filtering is another one. Uh, we don't want people inadvertently going to malicious websites. Uh, they think they might be a good website, uh, but they end up uh, having some malicious code on it. So we do content filtering. And then this also plays into uh, um, personnel issues. We don't want people stumbling on websites that might contain pornography or whatever uh, whatever categories are deemed uh, um, you know, undesirable. So uh, security patch management, as with everything uh, software based, we want to make sure that it's updated uh, regularly uh, and that those patches are applied and um, that the, uh, the vendor, as they go through their IT lifecycle, uh, they're creating these security patches and we want to make sure they get to your computers. And uh, some other tools that we use, um, device encryption. Uh, when laptops leave an office, you might have uh, device encryption. It's baked into uh, Windows 10, it's called BitLocker. And uh, this is a security feature that's gonna ensure that your data is secure on the laptop. If someone were to get a hold of your laptop and remove the hard drive, they won't be able to see the data that's on the hard drive. Um, these next two are really things that apply and are, are uh, pretty ubiquitous in the office environment. Uh, physical access restrictions, um, you know, the doors and the entry ways to your building are secured. Um, and then uh, a firewall. So if you're running a small business or any size business, you're gonna have a business grade firewall. Um, and that's gonna have a whole feature set in it that encompasses some of these technologies. Um, this is one that uh, isn't present anymore as we move to the remote work environment. Um, we have personal firewalls that are deployed. Uh, even a, a charter Comcast connection has a, a layer of security in there, but we're not uh, using the business grade firewall. So it's important to note that as we transition to this remote environment, that this layered security approach, uh, all these technologies complement each other. So where we might be missing something or something might not be deployed in your particular environment, we'd like to have another technology in place that sort of picks up the slack. So I like to see all of these technologies deployed in any environment. Uh, most of the time, they, they aren't all deployed at the same time, but the more you have in there, the more secure you're gonna be. Um, the next one, authentication controls, password management. Uh, this is, um, uh, people are using passwords, you're familiar with passwords. One of the, uh, the newer technologies, relatively new, been around for a few years now is multi-factor authentication. So in addition to the password, uh, which people have, they also have a token that rotates uh, on a time basis and it'll be a series of numbers or a hardware token. And that's required in order to provide that second authentication mechanism. And that's real popular right now. It's a, it's a great security uh, feature and it uh, usually can be implemented uh, uh, fairly inexpensively. And then the, the final one, and this really is uh, sort of the catch-all and uh, our, our, our biggest um, component is uh, an HR IT security policy. Um, and what we're talking about here is uh, end user training, uh, awareness into the, the current and common threats that are out in the environment, um, acceptable use, how to use business resources, um, uh, what's allowed in the environment. Uh, and all these technologies that we put in place prior to this, um, they're all really um, sort of diminished if the end users aren't aware of what to look for and how they can help protect the, the environment. So that's, a, that's an overview of how we approach security. Um, I wanted to give you some examples of some stuff that I've worked on in the past, um, stuff that I've seen out in the wild and, and uh, some of the threats that are out there. Um, the first one uh, relates to a lot of uh, businesses that run uh, QuickBooks. Um, QuickBooks is a, a common accounting package that uh, is widely deployed. Um, it's secure in itself, and it's, uh, it's a great uh, tool that people use in their line of business. Um, one of the, the threats that we see is uh, if someone has a problem with QuickBooks and they need to get some support, 
the first thing you do is you open up your browser and type in QuickBooks and whatever the error code is. QuickBooks won't open or QuickBooks crashes. And you're going to get a list of websites. Uh, uh, on there is going to be the appropriate Intuit uh, website, which is the company that owns QuickBooks. But you might also get a bunch of uh, people that are pretending to be QuickBooks that are trying to help you out uh, with, your, with your issue. So um, you'll type in the search. You'll click on the link. There'll be a picture of somebody sitting at a desk there and uh, a, a CV on all the, the good work they do. And you'll call the 800 number. And uh, you'll get connected to a support agent who will understand your problem and assure you that they can fix everything remotely. Just uh, let's get connected and get a remote session going. So they connect remotely to your computer. They say, oh, yes, we've seen this before. This is easy to fix. Have you up and running in a matter of minutes. Uh, but it's, it's going to cost. There's a cost associated with it. So they take your credit card information, and then uh, they either uh, stumble around for a few minutes, or they just disconnect the session and go about their, their day. And what they've gotten out of it is your payment info. They may have ran the credit card, and uh, you're, you're no better off than, than when you started. So um, uh, this really uh, boils down to uh, when we look at security, we want to be proactive. Um, we want to identify applications that we use in the business, and uh, before we're at the point where we need help. We have a resource um, that for those line of business applications that we can turn to. Uh, another one that um, I just had yesterday, I was working on uh, an incident. Um, this one uh, pertains to the recent um, COVID-19 and the coronavirus uh, threats that we're all going through right now. Um, this was a, a medical provider and uh, they normally exchange uh, they don't exchange information, but they exchange notices saying, hey, lab results are available. Log into this website, and you can pick up your lab results. So uh, in this case, uh, the end user got an email from a testing company and said, uh, your patient's COVID-19 test results are ready. Click here, log in, and download the lab report. Similar to a common business practice that they use, but in this case, the threat actor used the keywords COVID-19 to sort of uh, disarm the recipient and uh, make them think it was legitimate. Um, in this instance, uh, it was uh, seven days um, that the, the threat actor was in the environment. Um, they had the credentials and they were able to read through emails and, and uh, pick out what they wanted to or, or do whatever they wanted to do with that data. Um, and then the last one uh, that I wanted to share with you is a, uh, a manufacturer um, whose normal business practice uh, when they're ordering parts and stuff to bring into the factory uh, is to uh, issue those uh, those POs and then communicate with the vendors uh, via email. So they, uh, in this instance, so they had been communicating with the, the vendor and they placed their order and the vendor said back, uh, okay, this is uh, how much it's gonna cost, um, but uh, we've changed our bank accounts. Uh, we've switched from X to Z and, and this is our new uh, account number. So go ahead and send the wire there. And, um, Purchasing department said, uh, okay, they issued the wire transfer. This was a known customer to them. Um, they issued the wire transfer and uh, we were brought in after the fact to, to sort of unwind it and figure out exactly what happened and what went wrong. And I bring up this one as a particular uh, example of how even with these uh, IT processes in place, what we want to ensure is that uh, we're not doing things differently because we're remote. Um, in this case, a, a simple verification to the customer, say, hey, I, I noticed you changed your bank account. I just wanted to call and make sure that that's, uh, that's accurate and that you guys did that. Uh, that would have prevented this. As we move to the remote work environment, especially um, those kind of communications, those double checks are going to be very important because everything is done remotely. We're not getting the face-to-face -face interactions that we normally get sitting in the office. So I also wanted to... Um, sort of uh, talk about how uh, modern malware uh, acts and how it behaves. Um, back in, uh, you know, the uh, years ago, uh, people would gain access to a system and they were more interested in causing a disruption. So they'd grab your mouse and move it or type stuff on your, your screen and, and, you know, make a big scene and uh, let you know they're there. That's not how modern attacks work. And most of these are designed to infiltrate the system um, sit in the background and gather data that they can use at a later point. Uh, in the example of the, the medical office there, that's exactly what uh, the person did. They got access to the system. They sat there for seven days reviewing 
uh, email traffic and looking at stuff that's in the email system. And then they decided to send out uh, a blast email to all the contacts, trying to propagate the, the phishing attempt. So um, it's important as you're on your remote network, uh, just because everything is quiet and you don't see anything going on, to not uh, be lulled into a false sense of, I'm secure because nothing's happening. Um, I'm working as usual and I don't see anything going on. Uh, that's not always the case. This might be a good a good opportunity for me to just pause, Eric, and and at, you know ask the audience not not in an open format, but just encourage you to if you have any questions right now, uh, to use the chat feature that's uh, the that Jenny, uh, our moderator, uh, articulated at the beginning of the call. Um, we'll we'll be looking to tackle some of those questions at the end. So uh, you know feel free to as they come to you to type those those questions in, and then we'll. Um, We'll answer them at the end. I think there's a question mark at the uh, at the bottom of the screen or on the somewhere in the corner that you can you can identify to to use that chat question feature. Great, yeah, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. So that'll be fantastic. Um, so how do you determine what you need to do or what needs to be in place? Um, and we usually uh, take a look at the business environment and we segment uh, uh, into two different buckets. We've got a high security and a compliance group, and then we have a business level security. So our high security and compliance, um, what we're looking at here are people that process things such as personal uh, health information, um, PII, which is personally identifiable information. So if you're, you're, you're holding a lot of security numbers or email addresses, contact info, that's all called PII. Um, if you're processing uh, data for uh, Homeland Security, you fall under uh, NIST, um, uh, criminal justice. If you're uh, a local government or a police uh, station, you have access to the criminal justice information systems. Um, and then financial records. So these are banks, credit unions. So if you're in this bucket, you probably already have uh, a good handle on uh, what your information security requirements are. Uh, you've been audited, you have been told that you must meet all these requirements in order for you to get your accreditation and complete your business uh, um, as you want to. So uh, that's great, it's great guidance. Uh, and then we implement those processes and those changes and those technologies. But if you don't fall under those uh, high security or compliance organizations, um, you really fall into the business level security. So what we wanna stress here is that just because you're not processing financial records or defense information, your data is still important and it's still important to you and your business operation. It sounds kind of self-explanatory and a, um, it sounds like it doesn't need to be said, but um, people might think I'm not big enough to be hacked. I'm not big enough to be compromised. And if I am, then that's not a problem. It's minor inconvenience, but you do have intellectual property. You have your uh, business processes your uh, operations information, you've got uh, customer lists potentially. Um, so all this stuff, while it might not be high security or DOD level uh, um, data, it's stuff that is sensitive and valuable. So getting back to sort of uh, the root of everything uh, now, uh, being that we're rem a remote workforce, um, the essentials are, are more important uh, than ever. And uh, these are things like passwords, uh, policies, making sure your passwords are rotated, changed. Um, there's a really, there's a whole bunch of uh, um, checkbox items that we look at it. And, and uh, this is a, a great resource here on the screen. Uh, if you're sort of wondering, okay, I need to, I need to take a look at my environment and figure out if I do have some holes that I want to potentially uh, fix. And uh, if you, if you go to take a look at this checklist here on our website, safetynet-inc.com, forward slash checklist, uh, this is gonna give you a great starting point to say, yep, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Oh, I didn't think about that. That's something we need to take a look at. So I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. Uh, this is um, industry standard uh, stuff. So it's not stuff that's specific to safety net. Um, it's uh, stuff that's widely uh, used to secure any environment. So that's a great resource. Uh, another one of the essentials, uh, I talked about the um, threat attacks earlier, uh, and, and the underlying uh, uh, note here is that email is not secure. So uh, now that we're remote, we're not doing the face-to-face -face interactions, maybe less phone calls. We're doing a lot more uh, via email. So 
We want to make sure we're not sending passwords, security information, social security numbers, any of that information in email. Email is sort of like writing it on a postcard and dropping it in the mailbox. It can be read by anybody along the chain. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this, uh, uh, one of the new things that we see and we want to be aware of uh, now that everyone's remote is uh, HR information. So you don't want to be sending stuff about salary changes, um, layoffs, or furloughs. You don't want that to be going through email because, again, it's insecure and it can be read by everyone. I would, so, I would yeah. add, as you take a little break there, Eric, I would just simply add that um, the uh, reality of it is, is we're all used to sort of um, having conversations, whether they're performance evaluations, compensation increases, um, those types of uh, conversations in, you know, by walking into an office or having those. Um, if we're having, if, you know, if you're sending any of that type of information over the, over email, we're really recommending that you refrain from that because of um, the uh, the security risk of, of that getting shared. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great point, and and uh, thanks for for uh, adding that. Um, phishing attacks. This is uh, probably our our biggest uh, threat vector that we see. Uh, again, we put in all these um, systems and uh, um, technologies in place to prevent stuff like viruses and and uh, to try and weed out these uh, emails that come in. But most of the time, the, the initial attack vector that we see is coming in through email. So phishing uh, is designed so that uh, somebody who sends an email is uh, taking the role of somebody that you trust. They're trying to get information uh, by um, appearing as though a trust, you're a trust resource. Again, going back to the, the medical uh, organization earlier, they thought that was legitimate because they do testing. They, they receive those tests. So, uh, an attacker will send an email into a system and try and get you to believe that they're a person in a position of authority and a position of trust, and then respond to them with whatever they want to do. Um, this is the most common way that we see small businesses get attacked. Larger businesses with a, a big footprint, a lot of IT um, hardware out there, they've got a, a big surface area for attackers to hit. Firewalls, servers, websites. Small businesses usually don't have a lot of that, but they do have an email system. And that is why the, the attackers are using the email for these phishing attacks. Uh, here's an example of one. This came in, this is in our company, we, we got this. Um, and uh, this one was crafty because it came in actually on a day that we were doing um, payroll. So uh, we do uh, ACHs for our payroll distributions. Um, and uh, in this case, Kevin, uh, who's the principal, one of the principals in our company, uh, he received this as a ACH notification. Uh, it looks similar to the ACH notifications that we get when we process payroll. Uh, but there are a few things that stand out. Um, so in this particular one, you can see that the source address there is info at something.uk. Uh, that's not our payroll processor. That's not someone that we're uh, even remotely aware of. So that's a red flag there. Uh, we also see that uh, it's an aborted transfer. Well, uh, not on entirely uncommon but um, raises some suspicions and, and then the the glaring thing here is that it's got an attachment so the uh, attacker here wanted us to read this email and say oh I, my payroll didn't go through i need to pay my employees let's see what what's wrong here so you click on the attachment and then some malware gets uh, injected into your system so uh, this really goes back to the like i said the last line of defense um, is the end user training um, they're going to get, uh, when they do training, they'll get examples of this stuff. This is just one message and I, I have a, a whole, I could do a whole slide deck on examples of uh, different methods that they use to try and uh, look like a, they're a legitimate email uh, coming in. But um, so this really goes back to the, the people uh, are going to be the most important process or part of this process. Yeah. And I also, I'd also add that You've mentioned it a couple times, but it, I can't reinforce it enough. They're they're getting incredible use of the word crafty, but um, they're they're timing. You, you, one of the examples earlier was the COVID nineteen. You know the timing uh, that the that we're all anxious about this across the across the world. So let's 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 take these these moments of of vulnerability and and use them to uh, 
to create um, opportunities for them. And in this case, the timing of, of them <clears throat> understanding specifically, you know, payroll dates uh, or, or pay, not payroll, but pro, uh, you know, payment processing dates and timing some of these messages that way. It's really, um, it's really something you, the, the end user, as you've mentioned, that, that person who receives that email has got to be very aware of. Yeah, exactly. Um, and another thing that's uh, timely right now that we've seen a, a huge increase uh, in usage of is video conferencing platforms. Um, it's fantastic that we're able to have uh, webinars like this, um, that we're able to have internal meetings uh, within our company and, and see everyone's uh, face on the screen and, and collaborate in a way that's familiar to, to the office environment. It might be a little different, a little uncomfortable to, to start off with, but um, we've seen a huge increase in video conferencing platforms usage uh, recently. So some things to keep in mind here is you want to go with uh, and make sure you're using a business grade conferencing platform. Uh, I have some examples on the slide there. Uh, GoToMeeting, uh, which is a offshoot of what we're using right now. Um, Microsoft Teams and Skype, uh, Cisco WebEx. Um, and these are all um, business grade uh, platforms. Um, uh, there's usually, if it's a free version, you're going to want to be a little skeptical of that. Um, there's a reason it's free. It might be to get you to use the, the paid platform. Uh, it might be because it's advertising driven. Um, you're not really certain. So the last one on that list, Zoom, uh, there's a reason that we're, we're not using Zoom right now. Uh, and it's not because Zoom isn't a good product. Or it's, uh, it's because of the, the reason, uh, or the, with the recent uh, COVID-19 um, uh, situation going on, a lot of people have turned to Zoom. Zoom had a free product. So a lot of people said, this is great. It's got a great feature set. Doesn't cost us anything. Let's use it. And as that increase, uh, the usage increased, the hacker said, everyone's jumping on Zoom. Let's start taking a look at Zoom and seeing how we can, uh, how we can get into it. But how it's insecure, what kind of uh, exploits can we can we use? So uh, they've had a tremendous increase in usage. Um, uh, it's not to say it's a bad product. Uh, just right now, over the past seven to fourteen days, um, there's some security issues that I'm sure Zoom is going to. Uh, they actually have corrected a, a whole handful of them, so they're they're actively working on it. But uh, for right now, um, Zoom's great for you know talking to family and stuff like that, and, and it will be in the future. It'll be a great platform once they get the security issues so, addressed. So, so this is this is a, a story I've got to share with everybody. We, we've all been hearing about getting Zoom bombed. Um, I've, I saw a number of these things online um, or, you know, last week. Tuesday, uh, our family was sitting around playing cards. Uh, my son, uh, who's uh, Jake, who's home from uh, University of Illinois, was taking, a, in his senior year, he was taking a master's class. It started at 9.30 Eastern. So he said he had to jump to go get on his call. We were expecting him to be gone for 30 to 45 minutes. Comes running back at, in about one minute saying, you're not going to believe what just happened. Uh, in, his, in his class, um, two, two men with uh, ski masks appeared on the screen, swearing and sharing all kinds of nasty things. Uh, the, the instructor quickly muted those uh, two individuals. Um, but that didn't prevent them from sharing their screen and flipping up pornography to uh, to everybody that was participating. And immediately she had to close the uh, classroom down. Um, so these things are happening and um, they're not just happening at university levels, they're happening with companies, they're happening at elementary, you know, any family gathering, these kinds of things. So, you know, this is sort of our new world um, and we've got to make sure that we're very um, aware and, uh, and take these these tools very seriously as it relates to security as well. Yeah, and uh, going back to uh, when I said Zoom sort of gotten a lot of bad press uh, related to the incident, incidents recently, uh, this is a great example. That uh, particular Zoom bombing threat, um, it, it can be present in other web application platforms too. It's not a security issue within the platform, but in this case, it's not securing the meeting. So uh, when you do these meetings, you want to take a look at the, um, uh, the, the quick start guides, the manuals. Um, you want to make sure you're using a password so that uh, if you're having a business meeting talking about business, uh, uh, potentially sensitive topics, you want to make sure that the password's in place where that only the people that you want in that meeting are able to access it. 
Zoom bombing happens because these meetings are open, they're anonymous. Uh, anybody can come in and turn on their webcam and uh, start talking. So you'll notice in, in this webinar, you know, the participants uh, can't uh, can't start their webcam and present content to us. So uh, they can raise their hand, though. I'd be kind of curious if, uh, you know, if, if anybody out there has uh, had that happen to any of their video conferencing using Zoom uh, over the last uh, month or month and a half. Uh, so if you if you have had that happen, hit that raise your hand button. We'd be kind of curious to see how many people have uh, that's exp have experienced that. Yep. And then uh, um, one other final topic on uh, on the Zoom or the uh, web conference platforms is make sure it's updated. So uh, most of the updates are pushed automatically, but depending on the platform, it might not uh, be. Uh, Microsoft Teams uh, does their updates through Office, so you want to make sure that uh, you're updating that software regularly and uh, keeping your system secure. And then some other things that uh, you're gonna wanna check on. Um, for remote use, uh, when we're in the walls of uh, our office and we're tied to our corporate network, there's a lot of uh, uh, security controls that go into place uh, in that environment that we have to make sure are extended to the remote office now. So um, one thing you wanna look at is your antivirus and uh, operating system updates. How are they being applied? There's technology in place that does this automatically. Um, my laptop on my desk here, I haven't been in the office in I think about a month now. And um, uh, there's a software management agent on there that uh, will automatically update my applications and my operating systems so that uh, we don't have to worry about it. If anything falls out of uh, compliance with the updates, it sends uh, an email off to our central services team and they can look at it. Uh, if you don't have a system like that deployed, uh, if uh, people are at home working on their, their business laptops, just remind them that they need to apply their Windows updates. Uh, you can just type Windows updates in the, the start bar and it'll take you to the screen where you can apply them. Um, another one is backups. Now that we're not in the office, we might not be thinking about backups. Uh, backups uh, should be a, a routine and an automated uh, thing, but uh, sometimes people store data on their computers. So uh, you might want to look at a cloud solution to back up the data that's on the computer. Um, we use Microsoft OneDrive. That's a, a cloud-based file uh, uh, tool to um, store those files. So you want to uh, keep, uh, keep in mind uh, your backups. Backups are our last line of defense in information security. If everything else fails, all the technology we've put into place, uh, the training we've done for the end users, if that fails uh, or that's uh, breached or, or get if people get around it, then we have the backups to come and restore from. Um, and then your uh, uh, what amendments uh, you're doing uh, to your remote work policy. Um, I, I bring up the example of my home office now was just my home before, so it has my home computer in it. And uh, I brought my, my laptop here, so it's real easy for me to uh, uh, get my work computer and you know log into Facebook and, and check my personal email and uh, I would say sports scores, but uh, you can't do that right now. But um, so you want to make sure that people know, uh, and if if there isn't a policy in place, that work assets are to be used for work. Uh, and this is just to reduce the threat footprint. Um, it's not to say that if they use it, they're going to do something bad uh, intentionally. It's a, it's an inadvertent use that we're trying to avoid with the work uh, asset. So do your Facebook and and that stuff on a personal computer, and then uh, use your work one for business use. Um, and uh, if, if you do have some users uh, that don't have a work laptop or a work computer that they've taken home, there's a pen potential they might be using their home computer. Uh, that's a, a big security risk just because it's completely uh, uncontrolled. There's no security policy in place. So we, if you've got uh, home users that are using home computers to access business resources, you really want to secure that. That's a, that's a big threat vector. Uh, and then look at your business processes. If you're processing credit card data, um, in our organization, we'd walk up to uh, uh, the front office and they would process a, a credit card transaction if we needed it. Um, we can't do that now because we're not in the office. So you want to make sure you're not doing that again via email, that you're doing that via phone call or some other process, uh, maybe a, a website that handles your transactions. And then uh, again, the most important thing that we can do in information security is training. Um, it's it's uh, talking about stuff like this uh, with the end users, with management, uh, making sure everyone's involved, 
and knows uh, that the, the biggest uh, important and most important thing that we can do is to be aware of how people are uh, compromising systems and what kind of attacks they're using. So, uh, you know, trainings come a long way. Uh, the training package that we use, it sends out a weekly or a biweekly email talking about current threats in the landscape. And it really it just keeps information security on the top of everyone's mind. And uh, uh, it's a great, it's a great sort of a resource to use. Hmm. So I think, um, I think Jenny uh, might have, uh, if you have any questions, um, now's a great time. We'll, we'll take those and sort of discuss some of your concerns or uh, stuff you're thinking Jenny, about. I, I'd also be interested to see, Jenny, if, uh, if there have been anybody that has uh, had any of those Zoom bombs. What's, there have uh, what, been. We, have we there? Have two hands raised. So it's hmm. happening and people are seeing things for sure. So um, we also have a couple of great questions that came through and Eric, I'm confident you'll have great answers for them. So uh, the first question is, how can we know if someone is hacked, has hacked in and is quote unquote sitting in the background watching our activity? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we use a system uh, in information security called intrusion detection or intrusion prevention. Um, if you're on a corporate network, a lot of times this will be uh, included in the firewall. Uh, from uh, the remote workforce, um, we can use applications called uh, host-based intrusion de detention, detection systems. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll look at uh, past behaviors. So they know that you don't use your computer past six o'clock at night. Uh, and that's probably not true for most of us now because I know I've been working a lot more than I'm working from home. But um, they, they look for behavior patterns. And when they detect stuff that doesn't appear to be normal activity, they'll raise an alarm. Um, in the case of like an email system, uh, if they see logins um, from uh, an IP address, which is sort of like a street address, if they see that uh, login happening from outside the country, it might send an alert off to an IT provider. So uh, there's technologies in place for that. Um, and there's ways to secure against that. Eric, let me let me follow up by just assuming that uh, there are people potentially asking that question that don't have an IT security company uh, with with tools implemented, uh, though you know to 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 identify uh, the, those um, viruses. For for those that aren't using a company, what what would your suggestion or advice be? Uh, I take a look at that checklist that I put up earlier. There, um, there are you know there's basic entry level stuff. Um, um, when we talk about somebody sitting in the background on your computer, uh, when I used that earlier, I, I talked about them being in the email system. That was particularly where they like to sit. Um, people don't usually, uh, um, if you're running an antivirus package, they, they aren't able to inject that code into your desktop. So they're not, they're not usually on the operating system. It, it does happen. They can get through. But um, I, I, again, point you to that checklist and, and okay. review those basic security principles and packages. Okay, so would a combination of, of antivirus and maybe malware bytes or something like that be a, a good solution for somebody at home without those tools installed? Um, yeah, so that it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great start. Like I said, uh, information security is uh, uh, we use the the onion approach that I mentioned earlier. So you definitely want to have an antivirus, uh, an anti malware. Sometimes they're bundled into one. Sometimes they're separate packages, uh, and that's a great place to start. But then you want to couple it with uh, stuff like passwords. Um, you don't want to use the same password for your work email that you're using for your Facebook login uh, or maybe a recipe website. We've been doing a lot of cooking. I've now got all recipes uh, in <laughs> my bookmark. So um, if those platforms get compromised, uh, then you don't want to have the same password in, in use everywhere. All so, right, great. Yeah. The second question that came in was, what is the best way to send encrypted email? Or should you, is it, I'm sorry, is there a box program? I'm thinking they might mean like Dropbox that somebody should use. Um, yeah, uh, and going back to the same thing with the video conferencing platforms, uh, you wanna make sure that it's a business grade uh, solution. So um, uh, Microsoft uses OneDrive. Uh, OneDrive is a, a, a secure solution. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, penetration tested, it's it's hardened. So um, that's a good solution. And there's a, a whole bunch of them out there. Um, so you really wanna make sure it's a, a business grade solution. One of the, 
unfortunately, one of the easiest ways. If, if it's free, it, it may not be um, hmm. the best solution for you. So uh, you want to take a look at that. As far as encryptable emails, um, there are solutions in place for that. Uh, Microsoft has one. Um, Barracuda is another provider of encrypted emails. Um, when we, uh, we talk about using encrypted emails, uh, we still like to try and uh, not send um, information through the encrypted email uh, that isn't completely secure. So we're not always certain that somebody won't intercept that message. So encryption, mail encryption is great, but if you have another method, credit cards are the, the great example. Don't send a credit card via email, even if it's an encrypted email. Uh, it's better to do that over the phone. All right. And this question is coming in and they are asking, are Apple products, i.e. Mac laptops, less susceptible to viruses than other PCs? That's a great question. And uh, it's, uh, it's because of the, um, uh, you know, Apples have uh, traditionally um, uh, been thought to be more secure. Uh, Apple has, um, in the past, they've uh, sort of locked down their development and their application development. Um, and uh, and made things a little bit more difficult. Um, it's not to say that they're any more secure than uh, a Microsoft platform or not. There's certainly malware that's designed for Macintosh. Uh, there's certainly malware that's designed for Windows. Windows tends to be the primary platform that's in use in businesses today, uh, apart from a few uh, sectors like um, graphic design, uh, education. Uh, Microsoft is the predominant platform. So. The hackers will target that and they'll try and craft uh, all their malware for Windows platforms. Um, you, if you're running a Mac, you still wanna have an antivirus program. That's a base baseline of defense. Um, it's still a great idea to invest in a product like that. All right, and next question coming in is, with large events probably moving to virtual formats, are there any video conferencing platforms that are more recommended than others as to being secure and for the ability to handle large numbers of participants? Um, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, um, I don't personally do many webinars with uh, um, lots of attendees. Uh, the platform we're using right now is, is GoToMeeting. Um, and I think or, uh, or the version or the version called GoToWebinar, sort of right. their version yeah. of GoToMeeting. Yep. And uh, that's more designed for this format. Uh, but I think as far as participant count, uh, first of all, for the security aspect, uh, GoToMeeting and um, the Goto family has been uh, doing large scale uh, meeting conferences for a long time. So they're uh, they're pretty much at the top of their game as far as security is concerned. Um, as far as attendees goes, I think they have different packages based on the uh, number of attendees. This one, I think we scaled for 250 uh, participants. So um, uh, they can definitely yeah, scale I, up. I know that uh, GoToMeeting has the ability to scale to up to 1,000. So I, I yeah. think that there are price levels that you you have to purchase to, to increase that um, capacity, but it can go up to 1,000. Yeah, so that's this is a great platform. Uh, Microsoft Teams uh, is great for teamwork. They're going to be the usage of Teams has increased exponentially since we've gone into this remote work environment, mainly because people are using Office to begin with. So that's a great platform. Um, it's not really uh, designed for uh, webinars. It's more for a small team meeting, but that's that's a great tool. And that one, the security is baked in. It has been uh, from the beginning. And the patch cycle for Microsoft is is fantastic on those. Yeah, and we're we're actually rolling right from this conversation to a, a company wide um, uh, we call it huddle uh, at 12 noon today, um, and we're using Teams uh, for for that for that uh, that as the tool to communicate and have been and uh, works really really well for our organization. Okay, we have another question um, that kind of comes from that one, I believe. Which websites do you trust for software reviews? Something like Captera, but with expertise. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so when we look at, uh, to, to be honest with you, I don't usually, um, I don't usually trust a, a website to tell me which um, platforms are secure. Uh, and that's uh, mainly coming from uh, my background. Uh, I'm usually looking at uh, security blogs and stuff like that to figure out uh, what's secure. Um, 
most of the the mainline websites uh cnet is a good one for uh reviews on on products um uh, they're going to give you some information on uh comparisons and uh which ones are uh, going to meet your needs um but uh yeah anytime this is uh, also a great uh um, uh example of why it's great to have a trusted IT resource in your back pocket that you can say, hey, we're thinking about deploying this to our, our business or having our users use that. What do you guys think of it? And uh, when we do this on a large scale for large environments, there's a whole review process that we go through to ensure that it's a secure platform, but that can be scaled down to a small business um, very easily and, and that review can be done. Awesome. Um, if we have any more any more questions, we have time for one more. So if if there's something that you just can't wait for an answer to, please send it in quickly. Uh, otherwise, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, you can send an email either either to Traverse Connect or directly to us at SafetyNet using that email address that's showing on your screen, info at safetynet-inc.com. And we'll be happy to answer any of those questions for you. Uh, we'll also put together a document that includes the questions and answers that we've reviewed today, and that will be available um, via email as well. So uh, it doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in. So Tim, any last words for everyone? Yeah, well, thanks, thanks, Jenny. Thanks for the questions too. Appreciate that. And uh, it's encouraging that uh, you've got questions. I, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. If, if, if anything that we've shared today has piqued your curiosity and you'd like to investigate more, please feel free to reach out to us here at SafetyNet. Uh, we've got a uh, robust security practice that's focused on uh, helping fortify your business against the issues that Eric really outlined today. So we'd be happy to engage in a conversation uh, about how we can help you. Um, and if safety net's not the right fit for you, we're, we'll um, very uh, happy to direct you to the right organization that suits your business. So, and I want to put you in a position where your your information and your organization is secure. Um, but uh, you know, thanks again to the entire team at Traverse Connect uh, for for hosting this. A special thanks to Brenda, Molly, and Catherine for coordinating the webinar. Um, Jenny, thank you for uh, moderating and just. Uh, send everybody off, stay, stay uh, safe, stay healthy, everybody. We're gonna get through this. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care.